It's seven o'clock. Do you know where your children are? Hi, good evening. Hope everybody had a great week. Good little sound check going here. It's seven. All righty, sounds good. Good evening uh, to J.D. Richardson. Great to have you in the chat. Looks like Two Feathers is in the house. Hi, Two Feathers. Awesome. Bob Woodard. Hi. It's been a great week. Yes. I hope you all had a great week as well. Usually we'll just drag our feet here for a few minutes and do some uh, greetings as people start to connect. Hi, Ian Fox. Awesome to have you in tonight. Uh, be sure and uh, drop a comment over in the chat window to let us know where you're watching from. Also, if you have any RV-related questions, uh, throw those over there in the chat window as well. And uh, we'll uh, see if we can answer them. And if we can't, we'll go look it up like I did for uh, on uh, the Cedar Creek Silverback. Unfortunately, I forgot to write down whose rig that was, but I did do some research on it, so we'll chat about that a little bit. We're going to talk about the fallacy of low mileage on older vehicles uh, and uh, then we'll take your questions and just generally chat as the evening goes on uh, looks like Ian oh excuse me Tom Downey hi Tom great to have you in Tim Myers is in as well awesome I'm so happy to have you guys along with us tonight that's your rig Bob Good. Well, I did some research for you. Uh, Bob says his uh, his is the Cedar Creek Silverback. Hi, Aaron. Awesome to have you in. I totally missed uh, getting you on the Zoom thing. Um, I had something else come up, and uh, um, but we'll try again. Uh, are you still in Amana Colonies, Aaron? Um, I know you were headed south. You got another work camping gig. I think it was down in Texas. So uh, anyway, we'll uh, we'll get connected here eventually, and uh, we'll all get to see Aaron's smiling face. You can actually go see Aaron's smiling face right now if you go over to Three Tails RV. Uh, drop a link in the chat there, Aaron, um, and uh, join his channel as well. Um, he's got some good RV content, and he's a great guy. Jim Bertrand, hi Jim, awesome. Uh, how are things up in uh, Canada? Hey. Eh? I don't know why Americans have to say that every time, but <laughs> we do. So happy to have you along. Um, Aaron says it was a busy week with Oktoberfest. Yeah, I can only imagine, um, especially back there in Iowa. And oh, you get back in there to the Midwest, Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, where there's a lot of Germans. And Oktoberfest is a big thing. Um, I mean, everybody celebrates it. I guess we all need a reason to drink. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Aaron. Foodborne Chef, good evening. Happy to see you all. Can't wait to see you all in uh, Arizona long term. Uh, what, 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 what is LTVA? Vehicle area? Long term vehicle area? Uh, if you don't know about that, uh, a lot of the folks that go to Quartzsite for winter, you can pick up, I think there's two there's two passes from BLM down there. And one is basically for the whole winter. Uh, and then well, I think one is for like maybe a month. I don't remember. There's a small difference in the cost. Uh, but there is convenient um, uh, dump stations and facilities around the LTVAs, uh, down around the Quartzsite area. And it's very popular. There's thousands of RVs that go down there. Um, uh, for winter, you know, and the snowbirds. Uh, I don't think Canada, the Canadian border is open yet as far as Canadians coming south. Uh, so it's probably going to be a uh, interesting winter again at the RV parks uh, that cater to the Canadians. <clears throat> we chatted a bit about that last week. But I wanted to follow up with Bob. Uh, he, We were talking last week about his 2011 Cedar Creek Silverback fifth wheel. Uh, I went and looked that up a little bit, and I really thought it looks like a really nice rig. And but also it didn't appear to me, and I could not find any references anywhere uh, to the amount of insulation or the viability of it being a winter rig. I don't think that means anything, right? I believe you're in North Carolina; you're not expecting terribly cold temperatures. 
So I'm going to circle back to what we talked about. And for those that are just coming in and didn't catch uh, last week's chat <clears throat> or last week's live stream, Bob had the question about what to do because he was getting ready to prep to stay in his rig in North Carolina for, I think, three months uh, into the cold climate, in, into the cold of winter and what one should do. I've had that question several times uh, come in on the chat and also on my website at www.trbolin.com. I guess somebody said that you can tell how old you are <laughs> because I use the dub, 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 and you don't need that. Uh, okay, so anyway, trbolin.com. Uh, there's a great article over there, 18 Tips for Storing Your RV for Winter. And I do have a, a companion video coming on that in just a couple weeks. But um, we'll finish Bob's question, and then we'll drag our feet just to touch more, and I'll give you a more update on my little flood that I had when I first got home. Uh, but yeah, it, I think what you're going to want to do is, um, if it's going to get cold, uh, you, you definitely want to, I'm assuming you're staying in an RV park, okay, and that you've got adequate uh, power. So definitely going to want a heated hose. Uh, and then you're definitely going to want to um, get an incandescent light bulb in a trouble lamp, okay? Uh, old guys like me, we remember trouble lights. You know, Dad had a trouble light, and what it was was just a handheld light, but it had a cage on it. It had a steel back, typically, and then it would have a cage of wire on the front and a hook on it so you could hang it in the hood and you could work on cars or that kind of stuff, you know, where you needed spotlight. But what's nice about that cage, particularly where we're going to use it to warm the water bay, is that it holds it up away from the water bay, uh, and so nothing can touch it, nothing can catch on fire. I would recommend anywhere from a 60 to a 100 watt bulb. Um, you're, they're hard to come by. Incandescent light bulbs are getting extremely hard to come by. Um, I've got a bunch in my basement I noticed today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, and Aaron, yeah, that's a good point, Aaron. And I'll come back, I'll circle back on questions, but uh, Aaron just mentioned no LED, and that's correct. LEDs don't get warm enough. Because what we're using the incandescent light for is heat. It's warmth in that uh, cold water bay. Uh, the second thing you might get is get yourself a, thermos, a thermometer with an external temperature sensor. They're fairly inexpensive. Um, you know, you can get a decent one for probably 30 bucks, And then throw that in your water bay as a, as a backup to make sure you know that it's not going to freeze. Uh, then I wouldn't hold water in my fresh water tank, okay? Um, and then I would dump my black tank and my gray tank figure, fairly regularly, okay? Don't, I, I, I'm hesitant to say this, but don't let them fill. Dump them every couple days. And if you have a really cold spell coming, like you got some 20 and 10 degree temperatures coming, go out and dump it before that, okay? Uh, and then... When you finish dumping, make sure you lift your, your hose, your hose if you leave it connected to your RV, which is just fine. But make sure you take your hose and, and drain the water out of your hose, okay? Then some, uh, it's called uh, Reflectix is a good material. Uh, it is a mylar uh, on bubble wrap. And so it gives you some R value. It gives you some insulation value. You can use that in your windows inside. Okay. So you might, what I did when I was in Tucson, uh, and this works for hot weather too, uh, but in uh, 19 or in 20, when COVID first blew up, uh, I ended up spending a couple extra months in Tucson. <clears throat> in fact, until May 25th is when I left Tucson. And it was hot. It was hot, hot, hot. And to help keep the heat down, the first thing I did was I went and moved to a shadier spot. <clears throat> okay. And then the second thing I did was is I got a couple roll, big rolls of the Reflectix, and I cut it out, and I put Reflectix in the front windshield. That's your biggest heat source or heat loss if you're in a Class A. And a fifth wheel, you don't have to do worry so much about it. Okay. But, <coughs> excuse me. But the Reflectix works both ways. It keeps heat out and it keeps 
heat in or warmth in and or cool in. Um, and it's really easy to work with. You can always take the, sh the, the Reflectix down during the day, okay, because you want light in there. But as soon as it gets dark at night or it starts to get dark, you can just take and pop that Reflectix in the windows. And that's going to help you keep you warm too. And then make sure you don't run out of propane. Make sure you've got yourself a spare propane tank. They make these adapters that go in line with your propane tanks. Now, in a fifth wheel, you have portable propane tanks, so you don't have to worry about this, uh, Bob. But if you have like a Class A, where you have a fixed, or a Class C, where your propane tank is mounted fixed underneath the frame, you can get this these widgets and uh, that go in line with that, and what they do is they allow you to put an external propane tank on. Uh, I believe on my Amazon store, link in the description, you can find the widget that goes in line in the propane line and then it has a, a rubber hose and that gives you the ability to have an external tank on like when you can't move your RV. Uh, and those are super handy, but try not to run out of propane. Okay. Um, and those are, I think, are the main things that you're going to want to keep in mind. If you have, sl if you have slide covers, okay, so and a lot of rigs, they'll have a cover that comes out with the slide. You know, a fiber cover like an awning that come out with the slide. And so after heavy rain or snow or freezing rain, I'd recommend that you go out and clear those off. Okay? So just get yourself a broom. And you should be tall enough to go out there and just pop underneath it carefully. But you'll pop that snow off of those covers. And... Uh, sometimes that snow can get up there and it can get kind of heavy, particularly out in North Carolina um, where they get really wet snows. Here in Idaho, we tend to get really dry snow because the humidity is much lower here. But uh, And clear those off occasionally. Uh, it'll just prevent damage and it prevents water from sitting on top of them and potentially leaking through the awning and onto the top of the slide and into your rig. And then the last thing I would recommend is, is that you want to make sure all your seals on your slides are in good shape. And the way to do that is get yourself some silicone spray. Okay. CRC is my favorite. I have a link in my Amazon store to the CRC silicone spray. Do not use dry lubes like WD-40 or those others. Use silicone only. Uh, Liquid uh, Wrench has a great silicone product that I've used in the past. And just get yourself a nice microfiber uh, micro uh, towel and take and spray the uh, silicone on the seal and watch it. Because if it's in decent shape, that seal won't suck up a lot of the silicone spray. But if the seal is dry, you're going to see that silicone spray get sucked into that rubber. And that's exactly what we want to see because that's going to rejuvenate and and get that rubber back so it's nice and spongy and when you close that slide open close or open either way and remember there's two gaskets on the slide right there's usually an inside gasket and then there's usually an outside gasket uh, maintain both of those and uh, you should be good to go you don't have to do that just once a year on the seals unless you're in a hot dry climate like I am or like uh, foodborne chef who tends to be out here in the west where it's dry uh, we should do our seals a couple times a year but that should get you through the winter I can't think of anything else uh, we've got some uh, great sage advice that comes from the audience and so if anybody else has any um, uh, questions or uh, additions to the things to do if you're camping in cold weather that you would want to pass along to Bob throw them over there in the comments uh, while I grab a quick sip of coffee. Well, decaf. Uh, okay, so let's go back to the comments here. Running away from home. Hi, great to have you in the chat tonight. Where are you watching us from? Uh, Jim Bertrand. Yeah, you know, Jim, we've had the same weather here. He says it's all good up there. He's in Ontario, Canada. Uh, temps in the high 80s today set records. Well, we didn't set any records here, but we were in the 80s today, but there's a real cold snap coming. Uh, what looks like the next week could be rain, snow, you know, temperature temps down into the upper 20s. Um, summer's over. Uh, 
<laughs> as of the 20th of September, right? Aaron reporting back on Oktoberfest in Amana, Iowa. 10,000 people in a small town of 338. Lots of drunks. I can only imagine. Thanks, Aaron, for reminding folks that they can support the channel with my Amazon link. He put it over there in the chat for you. Also, those thumbs up are super valuable. When you give me that thumbs up, that's an indicator to YouTube that you like the video, you like the content, and they'll suggest it to more folks, which is a good thing for me. Uh, and all of those are greatly appreciated. If you're not subscribed and you're new to the chat tonight or you're new to the live stream, uh, be sure and subscribe and ring the notification bell. Uh, I do this every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Um, we're going to try to have a topic du jour, if you will, uh, which this week is going to be uh, uh, buying an older RV or things to watch for when you're, when you're buying an older RV and mileage is not the thing you want to be looking at. Uh, so we'll get to that. I'm going to run through the comments here again. Um, oh, okay, so the LTVA, Long-Term Visitor Area. Thanks, uh, Food Porn Chef. That's the area down there around Quartzite. $180 for seven months. So that's pretty good. What are my thoughts on 12-volt AC? Um, well, AC air conditioning takes about the same amount of energy to cool a pound of air, which is how they can, you know, they um, uh, uh, measure air when they're talking about cooling is in pounds or tons, really technically tons. And uh, one ton is 24,000 BTUs. And so it takes 24,000 BTUs to cool one ton of air I think it's one degree. Don't quote me on that. Where's uh, <laughs> Where's Randy Waller when you need him? He's an H he's an HVAC guy. He could school us on all of this. Randy, if you're out there, throw some comments in. Get me out of trouble. But what I'm trying to say is, is that to cool that pound of air, one degree is going to take the same amount of energy in watts, or technically joules, but we'll just say watts. Whether it's 110 or 12 volts, DC or AC. Um, no, don't, don't confuse AC, alternating current, with AC air conditioning in this discussion. So, I think 12 volt would be convenient if you do not have an inverter, you're not on uh, <clears throat> pedestal power, uh, utility power, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think 12 volt AC could work, <clears throat> but here's the thing with AC, and I think we did an exercise on this past this past spring. Uh, one of the uh, viewers asked the question about uh, our uh, AC on solar, and you can go to YouTube and find people that have done it. Okay, the fact of the matter is, it's going to take a lot of storage capacity to run solar, and in fact, it's probably not going to be economically viable. Um, I'm trying to remember, it was probably <clears throat> in May, if you went back and looked at the live stream from uh, like about the second or third week of May, uh, is when we did that discussion. And if you found, if you think you would find additional value in that, uh, make a comment and I'll do this again. Uh, you know, I'll do a, uh, the math on it and we can show it to you again. So, I think if 12 volts is all you have, it's probably going to work. But it's still, again, going to take about the same amount of energy, whether you use an AC or DC. Okay, Jim Bertrand says he's fingers crossed that U.S. will open the border in November. That'll sure help the snowbirds because I know none of them got south. Well, they, there was this one workaround, and it was right there up in your country. I think it was down in uh, Windsor, Detroit where somehow they could ship, quote, unquote, ship the RV to the United States and then cross the border, <clears throat> not in their RV, and they were crossing the border that way. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, 
I guess a few probably got through, but that sounds like a huge hassle. Okay, uh, I do know electrical, J.D. Richardson. Let's see. He says, I hope you know about electrical. I do. I installed a tankless water heater. I got the plumbing done, but not the electrical, as I keep blowing the circuit breaker. Okay, well, that just tells me that your circuit breaker is too small for your tankless uh, water heater. What tankless water heater did you install? I need to know the make and model. And we'll do a quick little bit of quick research and see. The other thing we got to keep in mind here is, is that your wiring may not be big enough, your electrical wiring. But once I can find out what the load requirement is for that tankless, uh, and I should be able to find that pretty quick, throw uh, the make and model in the chat, and we'll circle back on that in just a bit, J.D. Dave Cottrell. You have recommendations for solar panels that won't cost my firstborn. Yes. Um, I'm running Silfab, S-I-L-F-A-B. They were less than a dollar per watt. I think they were 80 cents. Don't quote me on that. If you go watch my solar video, um, at the end of that, I give you the breakdown on uh, everything that went into my solar system. And I believe that my cost per watt was a dollar twenty-five. That's with the solar charge controller and all the other stuff that went into that system. Uh, but you can go check that video out for specifics. But I think the Silfabs are fine. Um, you know, those are the ones I have personal experience with. I think any of them, uh, LG. Um, I believe uh, LG makes a great panel. I think uh, Samsung is in the solar panel market. Um, of course, you know, there's Renology and those guys, but they're buying, they're not making their solar panels. They're buying their solar material from an LG, a Silfab, or somebody like that, and then, can, then making their own panels. I do not believe they make their own panels. I might get corrected on that. Uh, but they tend to be pretty expensive. Uh, you want your solar panel cost to be, I would say, under 75 cents a watt um, and have a 20 to 25 year warranty. Uh, that warranty should guarantee around 85% the same delivery as the day the panels were new. It's going to vary from panel to panel. Anything less than 85%, I would, you know, I would be a little concerned about. Uh, but, uh, and those are, I think, the main features that I would look for in solar panels. But I think solar panels, I'm afraid solar panels, unless you get down into the real nitty gritty of trying to, <clears throat> trying to decide who's got the most efficient panels and those sorts of things, um, a solar panel is a solar panel is a solar panel. And if you stay around that, you know, I think if you stay between 60 and 75 cents a watt uh, for solar panel cost, you're probably going to be in okay shape. Hope that helps, David. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Two Feathers. Uh, stretch bubble wrap over the windshield and cover it with shrink wrap for ice insulation on the windshield. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Um... It just isn't as removable, um, but yeah, that would work. It, in his particular case, he's in a fifth wheel, and uh, I don't, I don't think there was a front window. Mm, yeah, I don't think there was a front window in it. But that's a good suggestion. Thank you, uh, Aaron, for putting that in the Campco Propane Brass Four Port T. Uh, that works like a great. It works great. J&B Lawn Care has a question. Hi, from NWPA. Hello from Northwest Pennsylvania. Really great to have you in. Uh, he says, question, would a bad rear auto level electric motor prevent the whole auto level system to not work? Lippert six point electrical auto level system. Yes. Uh, the system is looking for feedback from each of the jacks. Now how the auto level works is, is that there's a, a bubble, just like you would find in a bubble, inside the 
uh, control panel of those systems. And so what it wants to do is it wants to run the individual jacks um, to adjust the RB and get it level. So if you're down a little bit in the back, it wants to run the back jacks more in the front. There's a lot of feedback circuits. There's a lot of um, uh, back and forth that goes on in those systems. Uh, and if any of that communication goes down, it can take the whole system down. Um, I would look at fuses and those sorts of things. Um, and the question comes to mind is, uh, how do you know the rear electric motor is bad? Uh, is it just not working properly? Does it not run? Um, I mean, so answer that question for me, if you would. And uh, um, maybe we can sort this out. But yes, it is absolutely possible that one bad motor could disable the whole system uh, uh, on an automatic jack leveling system. Bob Woodward says, I uh, thank you so much, TR and all. I am very grateful. Thanks, Bob. Uh, keep watching, and uh, we'll look for updates from you in the cold uh, North Carolina winter. Aaron Jemison says he puts pipe insulation tubes in the gaps around the slide to keep the wind from blowing in. That's not a bad idea. Yeah, you know, like that, uh, those plumbing insulation tubes. Um, that would, uh, and that is foam, so it would add to some R value there too. Um, yeah, not bad idea. Good one. Uh, oh, Jim's in Winnipeg. I have one in Ontario. Who is that? That watches regularly. I'm sorry. Well, Jim, anyway, Winnipeg. Thanks, buddy, for reminding me. Tom Downey. Yeah, your, wind, your weather's headed our way, Tom. We had fifth gust of 50 at Whidbey. He's over at Whidbey Island, which is just off the coast there of, uh, of uh, Washington. Uh, what was that movie? Um, War Games. Go watch War Games. You'll learn where Whidbey Island is. 50 degrees today. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're expecting, Tom, uh, Next in the next couple of days. Almost 80 in Dayton today, it, Tim Myers reports, summer needs to go away. Yeah, you know, you kind of get to the point where, uh, <laughs> you know, you're, if you're used to fall, you're ready for fall and some cool, wind, some cool weather. J&B Lawn Care says, I just put four Rec 330s, 330-watt panels on our rig. And they're $213 each. Got them from Northern Win Arizona Wind and Sun. That's a good company, Northern Arizona Wind and Sun. They're over there in Flag. And, yeah, um, and that's a good price. What is that? Uh, what did he say? He got 330 waters at $213. 64.5 or 65 cents. A watt. That's a good buy. And rec, they make good panels. And I put 330s on mine. That's what I have on my uh, roof. No, I actually, excuse me. Check that. I have 310 watt panels. I have six of them. Richmond Essential Series. J JD Richardson reporting back on his tank list. Richmond Essential Series in Central Kansas, three gallon a minute. Campers connected to shore power. Okay. Richmond Essential Series. Okay. Give me just one second here. Uh, and let's see if we can pop that up. Okay. And one more thing here. Let's see what it draws. Okay, I'm still going to need to... Uh, oops, I lost my window over there. Because uh, oh, I brought it over here. Okay, let's get this back. JD, I'm going to need to know what model it is um, <clears throat> for sure. They have several here. They've got 3.5 kilowatts, 8. So, JD, do you know how many kilowatts it is? Uh, we're getting close, though. We'll have you an answer here shortly. David Cottrell. I just need to keep battery charged. Uh, all that works off the battery is just the lights. Fridge runs off propane. Okay, now, David, your fridge does require 12 volts to run. 
okay? This is a common uh, uh, misconception. There's nothing wrong with it. This is a safe zone. You can totally say and ask questions uh, of any sort, and you're never going to get uh, belittled. But every appliance in your RV, with the exception of perhaps the microwave, uses 12 volts. If you have a sparker on your oven, okay, it's very or sparker on your oven or your uh, range. It's very possibly uh, using 12 volts DC. The control circuits on your fridge, in other words, what makes the electrical work on your fridge, the lights, the computer, any kind of displays, those are all 12 volts and need your batteries, need your 12 volt batteries to work properly, okay? So anyway, uh, yeah, it sounds like uh, Northern Arizona and wind, I agree with J&B. Uh, and if you're just maintaining one battery, uh, you could get by with a smallish panel, uh, depending upon how much time uh, you, you split, spend in the RV. Uh, but if you have two 12-volt batteries in your RV, uh, probably 230 to 330 watts uh, would be way more than enough. Uh, to keep those things, keep your batteries charged up, uh, even while you're boondocking or camping. Correct, Bob. Yeah, Bob says no front window. Tim Myers. <clears throat> uh, he says the HWH pump check valves O-ring replacement was easy peasy, no more leaks. Yeah, Tim has HWH Lippert, uh, Lippert bought HWH. Uh, and he's he was uh, replacing those O-rings, and so I'm glad to hear that um, that you were able to uh, um, uh, change those out. That's good to know. Gracie seeking adventures. Let's see how far we get blown out here. Okay, there we go. Question, question, question. Okay, uh, do I recommend putting in gas additives, and do they help improve gas mileage? Also, if one does use additives, is it okay when gin is in use? Yes, um, I recommend that you, if you, if you, I'm assuming you have a gasoline powered vehicle and, uh, you know, sea foam is popular. I'm not going to recommend any particular additive. Okay. Uh, that's not my business. Sea foam is popular. Um, I've used Tecron in the past. I have had turbo cars and fuel injected cars. And I will use a little bit of fuel injection cleaner uh, occasionally, say every three to 5,000 miles. Um, and yes, it's not going to bother or hurt your generator in any way. Uh, you're, you should be just fine with using any kind of fuel additives that you would put in your vehicle, uh, in your generator. It should be no problem whatsoever. Hope that helped, Gracie. Uh, but yeah, if you feel like you need gas additives, uh, they probably will not improve gas mileage. Um, I, I'm not aware of any additive that's going to make a damn bit of difference in an RV as far as gas mileage goes, other than the additive of not driving with the firewall. Julie Gage is in the house. Yes, Julie, she's another one that likes to go to quartzite for winter. Hi, Julie, great to have you in. Okay, so J&B Lawn Care, he says... Uh, or they say, we were supposed to leave a campground and go to a dealer for another repair, and the driver's side rear jack would not come up, and they said the rear motor was bad, but got home and couldn't lower jacks. Yeah, um, did they replace that um, motor? But yes, it could definitely cause a problem with your jacks, uh, with the system, with those electronic systems. Again, because remember, they're monitoring uh, how much... Uh, a lot of times they have uh, measurement of how much amperage, how many amps the motor's pulling. Uh, that's an indication of how much weight is on that jack. And that feedback will go to the controller um, to tell it, okay, you know, uh, I'm in a safe zone, or if that amperage gets too high, the controller's going to go, oh, wait a minute, we got to stop because we're going to burn up the motor. So 
yeah, it's very likely that uh, it could cause a problem with it uh, leveling. What you might try is disconnect that motor, find the connection. There's just going to be a, you know, a plastic connection uh, to a, um, a harness. If you disconnect that and then see if it'll level and not level just not using that jack. I'm betting it won't. Uh, because it wants that feedback there to know what's going on with the jacks as it's raising and lowering. So I hope that helps. Okay, Tom, uh, excuse me, J.D. Richardson. He installed a, a tankless water heater, uh, but we're not sure how big it is. And it was a Richmond Essential. So we'll just go with the minimum, a 3.5 kilowatt tankless water heater. Um... I'm going to just pop over here. Let's see what I'll show everybody here what I found as soon as I get to the right here. And let's do this. And then let's go over here and pop that up. So I'm assuming it's something like this uh, that you installed, JD. And if we go down here and we look at it, let's see. Oh, there's many. Let's see if that's the smallest one. Okay, let's go with the smallest one 3.5 kilowatts. Uh, okay, looks 30 amps requires a 30 amp breaker and 10 gauge wire. So my guess is that if you're using this as a replacement for your water heater, uh, your, your tank water heater in an RV, that first off your wires are undersized. You need to go to 10 gauge wire. Your breaker's undersized. Uh, it needs to go to 30 amps and... 30 amps is a lot of power. In some ways, in cases, in some RV parks, that's all the power you're going to get. So you might want to consider a different tankless water heater. Um, but in the short and long of it is, J.D., you're going to need to run new 10 gauge wire. Are you seeing this? Am I not sharing this? I'm sorry. All I'm seeing is that. What's going on? What's going on here? Let me pull this over here. Sorry about this, folks. Oh, I know what I forgot to do. Um, sorry about that. Well, okay, so we'll just uh, quit trying to be fancy and just come back to the crux of it here. Uh, let's do this. Okay, sorry about that. Sometimes that just doesn't want to share. I don't get what's going on. Sorry about that. Anyway, so yeah, that 3,500 watt, uh, the smallest tankless water heater that Richardson has requires a 30 amp service. If you install a 30 amp circuit breaker on the smaller wire that's probably existing you could cause a fire uh, because that wire is not rated to carry 30 amps so you absolutely need to change the wire and the breaker but i think you might want to consider a different solution because 30 amps that's a lot of ac power even if you're on a 50 amp system, that's, you know, two thirds, almost two thirds uh, of your power budget for the whole rig uh, is going to the water heater. And uh, um, yeah, I think, I hate to tell you, but I think, uh, yeah. Uh, and I see you just made a comment here. I'll cycle back to the other comments, so I'm catching up on those. Uh, it's okay. I thought about running a separate circuit system. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, 30 amps, 10-gauge wire. Uh, those are going to be the minimums for the smallest Richardson. Uh, if it's bigger than that, uh, you might want to do a little research and find out. Let me just pop over here real quick, and let's just see what it says if we go up to, say, the 5. Because I bet it's going to be like 40 amps. No, the 5 kilowatts still 40 amps. 8 kilo, or excuse me, 30 amps. We start to get up in the 8 kilowatt range, and you're getting up around 35 amps. So it requires a 40 amp breaker, and that one requires 240 volts. So yeah, I'm going to have to say that uh, you're breaking, you're tripping your breaker because the water heater's drawing too much energy, 
and that your wires are undersized and you're going to need to do something to keep it safe. Okay, so let me uh, circle back here and catch up. Tom Downey, officer and a gentleman was a shot in Coopville, Washington. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? David Cottrell, uh, yes, I meant the actual cooling. It's just propane. Yeah, I only have one battery. Okay, then you could probably get by with a much smaller uh, solar panel. I was thinking maybe around 100 to 150 watts. And you should be able to get a decent one of those for yeah, around 50, 60 cents a kilo of uh, a watt so you know you're looking at a hundred to two hundred dollars for a solar panel then you want to get a solar charge controller uh, in your particular case you don't need to get all fancy a decent solar charge controller for that kind of system is going to cost you 30 bucks okay Gracie Seeking Adventures asks uh, would you like the pilot light in an oven can it be left on or should it always be turned off once I'm done using the oven I would say turn it off. It just uses gas unless you use your oven quite frequently. Uh, I would say turn it off. It's only It only takes a second to light. The second thing is, is make sure that your CO, your carbon monoxide detectors, are working properly. Uh, and that's a reminder to everybody. Uh, if you don't have a carbon monoxide detector, go get one. They're really inexpensive. You can get one from your favorite Home Depot, uh, Lowe's, Ace Hardware, probably a Walmart. Uh, but you want a CO detector in an RV that uses propane or has propane heat or propane cooking. Um, but I would say turn it off. And definitely if you're moving, it needs to be shut off. John Bezem Be Bezmek, he says, where do I look for the model HWH system that I would have in my motorhome? Uh, it should be on the control panel on the front. And if it's not there, uh, you need to locate your hydraulic pumps. They vary from uh, rig to rig, but mine are over in the right uh, front, right in front of the front right tire. I should say the driver's, you know, the passenger tire. And on there, there's going to be a placard that should have the model number uh, of your jack system. Uh, Aaron uh, was uh, Aaron spent time up around Whidbey because he was in the Navy up there, Bremerton, and that's just across from uh, uh, Bremerton is just across the river from uh, across the ocean. What's that bay there? That what's that called there between uh, Whidbey and the mainland? Ted Fiskness, new uh, to full timing, thirty four TT. Thanks for the explanation on the black tank video. Excellent. Yeah, Borax and Dawn works amazing. Yes, thanks, Ted. Um, so where are you wintering? Um, where do you plan on spending winter? T R uh, Jim Pertran asks, T R, how, how do you speed up retraction of the hydraulic leveling jacks? That seems sticky and very slow to retract. Okay, so that is definitely a sign that they're a little bit dry. And so what I do, in fact, here's a perfect example. Um, you know, my RV is still sitting in my driveway, um, mostly because I couldn't find storage. I finally got storage for it, and I went out to move it uh, over to storage last week, and I got another little problem. I think the oil pressure sender's uh, acting up, and although it would start and run, I couldn't go anywhere. It would go into limp mode, into protection mode because of low oil pressure, because the oil pressure sensor, I think, is gone out. But that's a long way to get around to saying that. Uh, on my jacks, um, I fully extended them, and then I took some uh, Dextron uh, tr transmission fluid. is what they use for hydraulic fluid. Uh, WD-40 works as well. I just had the Dextron handy. And I just wiped the tubes down liberally with the Dextron transmission fluid. And then I ran the RV up and down a couple, three times, and that sped things up. But I had one jack that was sticky, and it didn't want to go up. But after I treated them with the oil, ran them up and down a couple times, they were in great shape and they're working fine. So I would say get yourself some WD-40 jam or some uh, Dextran uh, automatic transmission fluid, uh, not synthetic, and, um, and rub that on the tubes with the clean microfiber. 
run them up and down two or three or four times. Uh, you know, retreat them every time you bring them up and down, you know, with just a slight oily rag or just a shot of WD-40 on the tubes. And wipe the tubes down. Uh, that'll help get, you know, dirt and material off the tubes. And they should go back up and start working just fine. Hope that helps, Jim. Matthew Tola is in from Michigan. Hi, Matthew. It's awesome to have you in the house tonight. Um, JB Lunkar says they ordered the part, so who knows when we'll see it. Yeah, you know, they're using this COVID as a really bad excuse for really long lead times to get parts. Um, that's unfortunate, but... Okay, John Besmick says, My control panel doesn't turn on. Where do I start? Fuses. Check your fuses and make sure your fuses are all good. Um, I know on my, my aunt and uncle, a uh, quick side story. Oh, and then what time is it? Oh, wow. I didn't even get to talking about <laughs> so much for having a subject. Um, my aunt and uncle had the HWH jack system on their uh, 06 uh, uh, base tar. Um, and it, the panel went out in it, and I had to replace the panel because it wouldn't turn on. Uh, so check your fuses, make sure your fuses are all good. And then, um, if the fuses are good and you know, the system's getting power, the panel's getting power, uh, then I would call HWH or Lippert and prepare to wait, um, uh, because they're busy. And I've heard some, uh, slow turnaround times, uh, coming from HWH. But, uh, and call them and see if they can help you step through some troubleshooting um, uh, on that, uh, John. Tim Meyer says, HWH recommends cleaning them with WD-40. It helped mine a lot. Do it once or twice a year. Yeah, um, on the newer ones, yeah, they definitely recommend the WD-40. Like I said, I just didn't have it handy, and I've used ATF, this non-synthetic ATF, uh, on mine for years, and I just know it works. Um, I just I just didn't have a, a thing of WD-40 uh, at my hand. I, I'm out, actually. Uh, huh, huh, huh. Okay. Let me see here. Oh, okay. Um, so typically uh, when I'm catching up on comments, if it's side chatter uh, between uh, viewers, I don't usually read it to the whole audience. Uh, okay, so there's JD's comment on uh, running a separate circuit. Foodborne Chef. Uh, that's a residential electrical water heater. You need to get the RV one. Yeah, Foodborne Chef. Um, I was going to suggest that um, to uh, JD. Um, that's kind of... A, yeah, that's kind of big for an RV. Um, but, okay, yeah, we'll we'll leave you to your uh, stuff. But you're welcome for the help, J.D. I see you commented right after that, so thank you so much. Uh, J.B. Lawn Care. I learned a ton when I helped install my solar a couple weeks ago, and wire size is a huge deal. Yeah, and so is wire length. All right? So if you're doing solar, or any kind of wiring, 12 volts... Uh, wire length and wire size are big deals. There's no question about it. Um, and you need to pay attention to that. The more current you're sending, the longer the distance, the larger the wire needs to be. That's a rule of thumb. But good comment. Thanks, JB. Bob Davis in the house. Hi, Bob. Uh, th things to have extra fuses had four go out last week. Yeah, you know it's funny how they run in streams like that, where you'll hit a well, you hit a, a, a span of you go months and months and months and never blow a fuse, and then blow three or four all in a week. It's it's maybe like they're on a time delay or you know they they have a limited lifespan, right? Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. All right. Um, 
Okay, I guess we'll talk about uh, the uh, uh, tips on buying an RV next week because uh, we're getting close to um, uh, 8 o'clock, and uh, I've, I've been trying to keep these down to an hour, um, hour and a half. Thanks, uh, Tom Downey. Uh, great to have you in. Oh, it's called Huge Sound. Puget Sound, yeah. <laughs> Puget Sound. Thanks, Tom. Uh, across Puget Sound, I was at uh, Naval Air Station, Whidbey, and Naval uh, Base, Remerton, for 15 of the 20 years. Wow, Aaron, that's wild. Ted Fistness. We moved to South Central Texas. Been here since April and loving it. Appreciate your channel for all, all of us with questions. You're very welcome, Ted. Thanks so much for uh, participating and uh, joining in tonight. It's always great to have people in and uh, happy to have you along. Um, okay, so because unless there's synthetic oil in the in the uh, hydraulic system, which I doubt, if it's newer, that there's a slight possibility it could be synthetic. That's where you would refer to your owner's manual to know. But there are the, there's a subtle difference in the seals they use in those systems, especially like the tube seals, okay? Because on those tubes, there's an outer ring called the wiper, which is supposed to keep all of the dirt and crud off. And then up inside of that is going to be an O-ring. That O-ring was made for non-synthetic oil, especially if you have an older rig. And so uh, a little bit of that oil, the synthetic, is going to cling to the tube, and it's going to hit that O-ring, and it could cause that O-ring to degrade. So I always err on the side of, like in that particular case, uh, using a non-synthetic ATF. Uh, and the non-synthetic non ATF won't hurt synthetic ATF versus seals, but versa visa, synthetic ATF will hurt the seals in a non-synthetic ATF hydraulic system. At least that's my understanding. I might get corrected on that, but yeah. Headed out on Thursday. Great, Tom. Um, about the right time of the year to be headed out. No, Ray, I am not in my RV right now. Uh, I am um, uh, at my home in Pocatello, Idaho, sitting in my office. It's not too dirty. I'll give you a quick look around. I'm a clutter bug, so just keep that in mind. Let's see. We'll get square here. There we go. And get off my face. All right. Enough of a tour. Okay, so that's where I am. I'm sitting here at home. Um, I'm, I'm planning on... I've decided to keep my RV. And I'll be planning on uh, probably next winter going south. I'm going to stay here for this winter um, and take care of some things. Uh, then I probably will head south next winter and I'll probably spend six, maybe eight weeks at the LTVA down there around Quartzsite, boondocking. So that's kind of my plan. And I know tons of boondocking spots between here and Arizona, trust me, because I've made the run. Uh, gosh, I don't even know. I would run out of toes and fingers uh, before I got through counting uh, back and forth. So I know plenty of places to boondock between here and there. And uh, it'll be one of those deals like uh, the summer of 2019. Um, my goal was to uh, dry camp, boondock, as many days as possible through the summer, and I made it 114 days 
in the summer of 19 uh, dry camping with no hookups uh, in on BLM Forest Service um, I was in several campgrounds uh, that were undeveloped uh, f- uh, in Fremont County uh, what's the name of that oh geez it's one of my favorites you know it's funny how you lose stuff I can remember you know something from when I was six and I can't remember the name of the Bill Frome County Park in Fremont County but if you drag your feet long enough, eventually it'll come to you, right? <laughs> That's all this gray hair. It's sucking all my brain cells right out of my head. Two feathers. She says, I'm worried about the seals around my windows. The sealant seems lacking or inadequate. Is that something a pro should do or can I do that? No, you can absolutely do that. Um, what do you mean uh, that it's inadequate? Now, a lot of times... Uh, like on my RV, on the windows, the seal, it's really weird that the seal only goes around the uh, the top. If I get down here shorter where you can see, I meant to widen the camera out tonight and I forgot. Um, you know, there's mine, the, some of the windows are not sealed underneath, okay? The, the, the seal runs around the top of the frame and then down the sides. And the reason for that is, is that the slide trays typically will be drained. There'll be drains in them uh, so that when water gets in there, it doesn't accumulate that it can drain out. And if they silicone the bottom of that, I guess that stops that from draining. So they, there's something else in there that stops the water from getting in. Um, but yeah, you can definitely reseal those windows yourself. Get a good quality sealant though. Uh, Seek a flex. You're going to spend a lot more money for it. Uh, but... Um, it's really good. I mean, it's used in boating, and there's nothing wetter than boating and sailing. Uh, and so it's going to seal those windows up nice. A good, super high-quality silicone will work as well. Don't go to Home Depot and buy the cheapest uh, tube of silicone you can get. Get the get an expensive tube of silicone, uh, and you're going to be better off. It'll last longer. And, yeah, you can peel that stuff out. Get yourself a, a plastic scraper that'll avoid, you know, that'll stop you from uh, scraping up the walls as you're trying to get uh, uh, the silico- the old silicone or the old sealant off. Um, but yeah, use a plastic scraper, no problem. Uh, yeah, sure, Jim. Hey, Jim says, thanks for clarifying the synthetic oil question. Oh, thank you so much, Gracie. Uh, Gracie Seeking Adventures dropped a very nice uh, super chat on me tonight. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. Okay, your HWH jacks have bronze wipers. The Teflon rings are support for the O-rings. Yeah, okay. Um... The Teflon rings are support for the O-rings. Correct. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Either way, that uh, synthetic is going to get to those O-rings eventually. And if those O-rings aren't uh, made for synthetic, uh, it will degrade them. And then you're going to have a leak. At least on the older systems. I don't know if they've gone to synthetic on the leveling jacks or not. I'm going to have to educate myself on that. Let me Let me make myself a little note. All right, that will remind me. Oh, two feathers. Oh, you're welcome. You're very welcome, Ray. Uh, 2008 Winnebago. Thanks, uh, two feathers, for clarifying uh, what you've got. I I I like to know what everybody uh, is driving. I try to remember. It's kind of hard sometimes, though. Um, but yeah. Maybe we'll take a moment here at 8 o'clock uh, to say I'll probably wrap it up here in just a bit. Uh, give me that thumbs up if you like the content. Um, that's always greatly appreciated. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. You can support me on my Amazon store. There's a link in the description below uh, where you'll pay the exact same price, but I'll get a small commission for what you purchase. Again, it's totally anonymous. I don't know who's buying what. Uh, I just see that people buy stuff. Like uh, I, I saw where somebody bought... Um, a support, one of those uh, 
power supports for the front end of a fifth wheel jack. Uh, just the other day on one of my stores. Uh, I suppose there's ways that I could track better. I don't. Uh, it's such a minimal amount. It runs anywhere from 50 to to $100 a month. Um, but it's nice because it helps pay, you know, the $65, $80 a month I spend on Internet. And there's always software and, and this and that you have to have. So it every little bit helps offset the cost to run the channel. I don't break even in the winter. I lose money in the winter. And then from about April till about September, I make money. Uh, but over the 12 months, it kind of evens out. Uh, I don't, I'm not making bank on this uh, YouTube channel, trust me. That's okay, though. I love doing this. I love interacting with everybody. And um, you're very welcome, Gracie uh, and Jane B. Yeah, I love hanging out at the campfire. Uh, I don't drink beer at the campfire, though. I have one rule. I have to drink whiskey. Uh, Food Port Chef asks, any good tips for LTVA areas staying that long or good areas to stay in? Where not to go if you have a large Class A with a car versus travel trailer or Class C or van? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that I, I, I'm not... I've only been over to Quartzsite and stayed a couple times and not for a long time. Um, I went to an RV rally over there uh, in 18 on my way to uh, Ocotillo Wells, uh, California. And uh, But I know a lot of folks that stay down there. Um, and I would just do a good uh, YouTube search uh, around the Quartzsite LTVA and you're going to get flooded with more information than you can imagine. Uh, that's going to tell you, um, uh, you know, where you can go. Uh, there are, there's tons and tons of areas that are completely acceptable for uh, a Class A RV, where you're not having to quash, you know, cross through washes and do that kind of nonsense. Uh, but um, yeah, as far as best places to go, um, you know, I think a lot of people really appreciate the area that's south of Quartzsite proper. And I can't remember what highway that is. Is that 52? Yeah, I don't... I, 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 I have to admit, I've spent most of my... Well, I spent all my winters over in the Phoenix, uh, Tucson, uh, Picacho Peak area uh, in Arizona. And I really love that place. And I know lots of places I can go boondock out there now. Okay, how are we doing over here in the chat? Thanks, John, for coming in. We'll see you next week. Tom Downey says, The best seller is the new Gorilla Sealer Super Stuff. <laughs> that sounds like that spray plastic crap that the guy shows you he can spray on and it will waterproof his boat. Yeah. Um, the problem with that stuff is is that um, uh, it's expensive. It's 20 bucks a can. It don't go very far. And yeah, um, I don't know. I saw an ad. I don't want to get too far off track here. I saw an ad, might have been yesterday, for aspirin. That's been repackaged and changed from a tablet form somehow. Oh my gosh, I don't know. But it just, to me, looked like repackaged aspirin. Instead of getting the Bayer aspirin, you know, the 500 tabs uh, in the bottle, you know, this stuff was repackaged and it probably was in gel, gel caps and all that crap. And they were probably charging you 30 bucks for... 14 cents worth of aspirin. Thank you, Ted, for the thumbs up. Steve Linder. Hey, great to have you in uh, tonight, Stephen. Uh, Mr. Borax. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, it works. Uh, I don't mind saying it. It works. Okay, Tom Downey says, we'll not be around for the next few weeks. No internet at the new house. 
Well, we uh, hope you have a great uh, stay down there, and uh, you're always welcome anytime, Tom. Uh, we'll look forward to having you back. Awesome, Jim Bertrand. Uh, you're a very kind fellow, and I appreciate uh, having you a part of the channel and a part of the family. Uh, in fact, everybody that comes and watches uh, is greatly appreciated. So we'll go for one last round of comments, uh, co questions, concerns, and uh, otherwise I think we'll wrap her up in less than an hour and a half. I'll run as long as people are asking questions, um, up to an hour and a half. Uh, but if the questions... Uh, uh, Peter off, then uh, I think we'll call her good. So one last call for questions. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Ray Castile, Castile. I have a 2008 Winnebago Site Sear 34M. I would like to replace the toilet. Do I need to get a specific one, or can I get any one in particular? Um, yeah, if uh, the toilet flanges are pretty universal to a certain extent at the floor. Where you get into some uh, differences might be in what they call the stem. And so typically there's going to be a floor uh, mount. And that's going to be very similar to a home toilet, okay? The exception is, instead of using a wax ring, it uses a soft, spongy rubber ring, okay? Then the stem sits on top of that, and then you go up, and then there's usually a split, and there's a couple of gaskets in there, and then the toilet sits on that, okay? In fact, very uh, apropos question, because I am releasing uh, a re-edit, to a video that I released in 2017 that I got a copyright strike on. And we'll be doing that as a uh, premiere on Sunday night this week, this coming Sunday, at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, and in that, uh, you'll see me fixing the vacuum breaker on the toilet. So you can see the anatomy of all the parts of the toilet. That's a long way to say... You need to get one that will fit the space, and you're typically probably looking at Dometic uh, as going to be the, the best possible manufacturer to find a reasonably good RV toilet built designed for an RV. Do not put a residential toilet in. Okay? Do not do it. Uh, you will get 10 flushes, in your ho and your holding tank's going to be full. So... You want to use, uh, definitely want to use an RV, uh, a toilet made for an RV. Two Feathers, you are so kind. Thank you so much for your super chat tonight. Regina Wood, uh, trying to decide to flat tow or tow dolly on a Class C. No, tow dollies. No, don't do it. I had a tow dolly. It was a pain in the ass. First thing is, you're going to get into these sites that are going to be just big enough for your rig, and then you got to put the tow dolly somewhere, okay? I was at a state park in Missouri where I actually had to take my tow dolly and park it out by this utility building. They had some parking over there for overflow parking, and I put my tow dolly over there, and I had this big-ass log chain, and I log chained the wheels, and I got it tied down so it wouldn't get stolen. The second thing is, uh, you can't back up on a tow dolly because tow dolly is typically where the tires come up onto the dolly. That plate pivots like this, okay? So if you're trying to back up, you end up, you have a triple pivot, okay? You got the pivot at the ball. You got the pivot at where this thing is, where the pivoting table is that, the you know, the tires sit up here on this table like this. Uh, they're impossible to back up for more than about 5, 10 feet and keep them straight or get them to go where you want them to go. Um, because that pivot on the tow dolly just doesn't seem to... I mean, the pivot at the tow point is exactly correct. I mean, it backs up like every other backup. Um, <laughs> Tim Meyer says, and I agree with you, um, tow dollies are good for enhancing the color of your vocabulary. Yes, they are, Tim. Uh, tow dollies are bad. 
if at all possible and you can afford it, flat toe, period. You're going to be so much happier if you can flat toe. Um, the second thing about tow dollies is it's a 15-minute loading process, and I don't care how good you are. By the time you get that car up on the tow dolly, you get the straps up over the wheels, you get those cinched down, you move around a little bit to get the car to move on the tow dolly so you can re-cinch those tow straps, the straps up over the wheels holding it on the tow dolly, and you're ready to go down the road, you're 15 minutes. If you're flat towing, it's less than five. You know, you come in, bing, bang, boom, and, you know, you pull your pins, you pull your cables, you pull your safety chain or your safety cable, you pull your electrical, and you're gone. You can go someplace. Um, so yeah, I would definitely flat tow. I would not go with a tow dolly, uh, if I could avoid it ever again. I hope that helps Regina. You're very welcome, Bob. Uh, at Regina, oh, uh, Tim Meyer says, I have done both and prefer flat towing, but it's costly. Well, it can be, um, because you got to have the right type of vehicle. You know, you have to choose a specific vehicle that can be towed four down. Um, so if, if replacing or getting a toad, as we affectionately call them toad, T-O-A-D, uh, doesn't work in your budget, then you could go with a tow dolly. But I think you'll soon find out like I did because I've done both. I've towed and with a tow dolly and flat towed and I couldn't flat tow. I couldn't get to a spot where I could flat tow fast enough, um, for me personally. Uh, Don Chalfant, Chalfant, can I explain the difference between TPO roof and rubber roofing? Anything special to do for TPO? Well, you clean them both the same way with a good uh, quality uh, roof cleaning detergent. You can buy from Camco has one. There's several others out there. Um, just keep it scrubbed off nice and clean. Um, the difference between EDPM and TPO, EDPM is a pure rubber. TPO, if memory serves, has a little bit of Teflon in it. Now, don't quote me on that. Uh, it's been quite a few years since I've re read about that, and it doesn't and it doesn't stick in my head right now what the what the subtle differences are. Um, I put EDPM on my roof. There's a series of four videos and or you can watch a summary video of me replacing the roof on my RV uh, in, on my channel. Um, and I used EDPM, TPO, you know, it's Fords and Chevys, okay? Uh, you know, I say this all the time and, and this, these are really common questions, uh, you know, but I, I, use, I use the example Fords and Chevys. Uh, you're either a Ford guy, a Chevy guy, or a Dodge guy, okay, when we're talking pickups or something like that. Uh, it's either gas or diesel, you know, and everybody has strong opinions about that. It's either, you know, flat toe or dolly or a trailer. You know, everybody has their opinions on that kind of stuff. The main thing you want a roof to do is protect your rig. And I don't think there's going to be any significant difference in the lifespan or the care and maintenance of a rubber roof, it, di there will be no difference between TPO and EDPM. That's my opinion. Um, that It's worth what you paid for it. Uh, but I don't think there's anything different. Uh, and the only, and the, I think the thing of it is, is just keep them clean. Check your seams regularly. And if your seams need touched up with uh, uh, lap sealant, uh, touch them up with lap sealant. Keep that roof dry. You're going to be a much happier RVer down the road if you keep that water out of the rig. Well, we got some new life breathed into it. I was about to shut down, but uh, we got 33 folks in and lots of questions. So uh, we're going to uh, keep rolling here. I have another 15 minutes worth of coffee. Um... Okay, where are we at? Uh, great, thank you. What was that brand of toilet again? Uh, Dometic. D-O-M-E-T-I-C. Uh, also known as Sealand. S-E-A-L-A-N-D, Ray. Uh, they're the main manufacturer of RV toilets. 
Jim Bertrand asks, uh, what's my take on composting toilets with urine diverted, which allows combining of the gray and black water tanks for boondocking efficiency, can haul fresh water with collapsible tote? Absolutely great. I know a bunch of people that are using compost toilets. In fact, uh, my friends, uh, Zach and Tiff Tiffany, uh, have a composting toilet. I know several people have composting toilets, and they say they're just fine. They love them. Uh, you know, they work great. Uh, I think being able to combine the black and the gray tank would be amazing. Uh, my particular rig, I can carry 105 gallons of fresh. I have 40 gallon black and a 45 gallon gray tank. So that would give me 85 gallons of gray water uh, if I had a composting toilet. And in fact, now that I've kind of decided that I'm going to keep the RV, I might seriously consider doing a composting toilet. Uh, that's a great question, though, Jim. Thanks. Uh, and yeah, you could definitely... I've hauled water with collapsible totes for my rig. Uh, in 2017, when I went to Birch Creek to watch the solar eclipse, uh, I was 14 days... And I had five people coming out to my camp spot um, to party for the solar eclipse. And so I, I was, um, you know, I had taken and dumped gray water. Uh, I never fill my black tank when I'm, you know, when I'm camping anyway. My gray water always fills. And so I had dumped some gray water. I just kept a five-gallon bucket and I pulled off like 15 gallons of gray water so I'd have some capacity and then I hauled some water up in a, in, you know, I have two of those collapsible water jugs uh, and uh, put some water in my tank so I'd have extra water while I had company because I was right at the end of a 14-day stay. Um, and it all worked out great. Uh, everybody was super happy. Of course, they all brought drinking water and stuff for themselves. But it's nice to have water to wash your hands after you go to the bathroom. It's also nice to have a bathroom. Although there are bathrooms out there at Birch Creek, I was way south of where the bathrooms were, but you could stay up in the area where the bathrooms are out there. Um, Judy White says, baking soda and changing the water filter did the trick in solving the odor coming from the faucets. Thanks again, another happy camper. You're very welcome. Judy was reporting some uh, malodorous water uh, coming from her holding tank. And uh, to me, it probably, it, it's, it stunk of, wink, wink, you know, pun intended, it stunk of a bad filter. And so uh, I, had, I had suggested that she add some baking soda to her holding tank and that she change her water filter. And it sounds like it did a great job. Great. I'm glad to hear that, Judy. Food porn chef, flat toe versus car on trailer, flat toe all the way. No question about it, dude. Okay, great. And Judy was also working on, uh, she's having a problem. They have a smaller Winnebago and it didn't have stabilizing jacks. And so she was not feeling good about when they were parked. And so uh, we made some suggestions last week and it sounds like she's working on getting this jacks, uh, getting some jacks and, and doing that. So great. Let us know how that works out for you, Judy. Tim Myers, he says, I still prefer flat towing because of having to find somewhere to park the trailer and a lot of Class Cs do not have the tongue weight needed for a car trailer. Yeah, that's absolutely true. You remember when you're flat towing, there's vi virtually no tongue weight whatsoever. There's no weight put on the tongue at all. Uh, but if you have a tow dolly, uh, there is weight put on that tongue uh, on the rear bumper. And so that's another consideration. Yeah, uh, I can't say it enough. If, if you can avoid flat towing, do it. You'll be a lot happier. Um, yeah, and that you're you're right. Finding some place to put the trailer if you don't have space in your, uh, uh, like, and this is this is really common. If you go to, you know, one of the reasons to have a small or a Class C is to go to be able to go to some of the smaller campgrounds. You know, Class A's in Yellowstone are non sequitur. You could do it, but very 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 limited. Okay, uh, I don't think you can. I don't think there's a campsite in Yellowstone. National Park that would accommodate a 40-foot RV. Now, I might be corrected, but they're going to be few and far between. Trust me. Uh, so that's why you want a Class C. But if you have that tow dolly, that's an extra 10 feet, approximately. Okay, from the 
from the tongue to the back of the toe dolly, it's about 10 feet approximately. And so you got to find some place to put that if you're in a smaller campsite. Uh, again, they're a huge pain in the rear. Uh, Larry uh, McBride says he has noticed that after I dump my tanks and drive home, there's a bad smell in a camper. Could the roof vent for the toilet be clogged? Uh, maybe. I think it's more likely that your gray tanks... Um, our pro your gray tank probably needs a good uh, soak with some borax, some kind of an a, a degreasing, concentrated degreaser, zap, simple green, simple purple, concentrated degreaser, that's the key word here, doesn't matter the brand, concentrated degreaser, and uh, yeah, it sounds like you probably need to treat your gray tanks, Lair, um, uh, that'd be my guess, uh, but to... Uh, it's, there's nothing wrong with crime, climbing up on the roof of your RV with a water hose and flushing that vent out. Just make sure your tank's empty, right? Uh, but yeah, there's nothing wrong with just getting up there with the water hose and actually sticking the water hose down that vent and turning it on and flushing it out. Uh, if there is a plug in it, that would clear it out. Um, yeah, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing special about those vents. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, Camco makes these uh, vents that work on the Venturi principle. I'm checking the time there, sorry. Work on the Venturi principle. So when you're going down the road, they turn into the wind and it creates a vacuum. It goes it goes around this cone-shaped item. You know, it kind of looks like, I don't know if I can make my hand look like that, look like this. But as the wind goes around, it creates a vacuum at the back and that actually sucks air right out of the tank. Uh, those are popular. I have those on my rig. Um... But yeah, it sounds like it's probably your gray tank. I bet you need to treat your gray tank and get it clean. Uh, oh yeah, I saw that there was a question I might have skipped over. Let me go. Let me roll back here. Um, Jim asked. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, no, okay, we got that one. I thought I saw it. Maybe I just uh, skipped over it, but we'll uh, address it. Uh, Jim Bertrand mentioned uh, earlier uh, that white vinegar is good to clean microscopic fungal growth, black spots on rubber TPO roofs. Yes, uh, white vinegar. I was at Walmart today, and I noticed they had 30% vinegar uh, over in the garden center. Um, and uh, But, yeah, just 5% vinegar uh, in some water, in a bucket of water. Uh, we, we'll take care of that. Uh, it's okay to use bleach as well. Uh, just rinse it off. Okay, make sure you get it rinsed off right away. But a light bleach solution will also take care of that mold. Uh, but yeah, both of those work great. Uh, Food Force Chef adds about the tow dolly and long tow lengths and less places to go. Absolutely. You're very welcome, Don. Thank you for coming in and uh, commenting tonight. Timothy Tit. Tentinger, 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 Hi, Timothy. Welcome. Your first time commenter. Besides being easier to maintain, are disc brace brakes on a thirty-five forty fifth wheel worth the extra money? Um, I don't know if you know. That's one of these things that I struggle with with newer RVs. They've had drum brakes on fifth wheels and travel trailers and tra and trailers of all ilk for years and years and years, and they work just fine. And they're usually electric, um, so they're simple. Okay, uh, I don't. So you're considering getting a bigger fifth wheel, and and, and an upgrade is disc brakes. I think, for me, this is just my opinion, I would take the money I would spend on the upgrade for disc brakes and do an upgrade on the inside, something you're going to enjoy. Because how much time do you spend towing? 10% of the time you're using your RV, maybe you're towing it, maybe 15, maybe 20. The rest of the time you're spending it inside or you're spending it using the RV or the facilities of the RV. 
So my take on that one would be I would put the money on the inside and not worry about getting disc brakes. I don't think it's worth the extra money. Um, my opinion. And take that money and put it on the inside and then spend a little extra uh, at a really nice RV park occasionally. Hope that helps, Timothy. Uh, food porn chef, what about PVC roof on travel trailer? Same drill. Keep it clean. Check the seams. Uh, PVC, you don't, I mean, in reality, you know, I say you should use a roof cleaner. Um, most of the time, the when I clean my roof, I just use Dawn Dis Soap. You know, uh, scrub the roof with Dawn Dish Soap and wash it, rinse it off nicely. Make sure there's no residue left on it. I've never had any trouble. Um, but, uh, yeah, on PVC roof, you can use any soap. PVC is, uh, uh, you know, ultra durable. You're welcome, Ray. Jim Pertran, uh, will baking soda be good to flush RV water softener that hasn't been used for a while? Don't want musty smell. Yes, Jim, that will take care of it. Uh, you know, uh, you can just, uh, uh, if you're flushing your whole water system, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with, uh, oh, water softener, not water heater, water softener. Yeah, that, that, that'll that handle it, but you shouldn't get much of a rusty taste out of your water softener. I would, uh, I would recharge it, you know, back flush it and recharge it, uh, whatever your procedure is for your water softener. And yeah, throw a little baking soda in there. That won't hurt. Um, but do the baking soda treatment before you resalt it, before you recharge the water softener, um, as sequence order, you know, order of operation. Um, okay. So, uh, okay, good. We're coming right up on eight thirty, and things are starting to roll off a little bit. So good. Uh, Timothy Tettinger. Thank you. Uh, it will be our first rig and we'll, we, and we going full time? Okay, good. Listening to people before we buy, but thank you very much. Yep, I wouldn't waste money on disc brakes. I would put it on the inside. Yeah, Aaron's on top of things, Tim. You know, Aaron is a great moderator. I can't say enough good about him. Two Feathers, how is dear old dad? Doing fine. Um, I got a text from my spy in the neighborhood. Uh, that he was out mowing his lawn. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Well, he seemed none the worse for wear. I spoke to him. Uh, uh, yeah, I've been talking to him two or three times a week. And uh, he, he seems to be doing fine. Uh, they still have PT and OT in there. Physical therapy and occupational therapy. But seems like he's doing fine. So thanks for asking, Two Feathers. Thank you, Jim, and thanks to everybody. It is 8.28. We're going to call this one good. It's sure funny how 90 minutes flies. Uh, I got off early on some great comments, and I appreciate everybody participating tonight. Next week, I will talk about, first thing, <laughs> at the beginning of the show, uh, tips on buying an older RV, what to look for, and mileage is the last thing you want to be concerned about. So we're going to call it good. Hi, Doug D. Uh, sorry you're late. We're just wrapping up, but uh, be sure and join us um, uh, next week. Dan Phillips. Hi, Dan. Great to have you in. There is a comment here that relates to drum brakes. I think we'll read, and then we'll call this one good. Uh, Dan Phillips. Drum brakes are different, but no more involved to maintain than discs. Drum brakes, drum brakes store better during periods of non-use. There's a reason to co Toyota still puts rear drum brakes on the Tacoma. Yeah. Because they just work. They're simple. They don't take a lot of goofing around. And I'm not sure if electric disc brakes, it seems to me like they'd have to have some kind of hydraulic fluid uh, involved. And that means you got some kind of a... Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I'm going to stick with my original uh, assessment. Put the money on the inside, I would skip the disc brakes. 
Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Tim Myers. Doug, thank you so much. Oh, wait a minute. It looks like you're working up to a question. Get her in there quick. We're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Food Porn. Hi, Linda. Sorry you haven't been feeling well. Um, hope you're feeling better. That's Camp Gore 1. Her, her non-handle is Linda. Okay, I think we're going to have to wrap her up tonight. Uh, it's been a great time, uh, as always. Uh, all the questions are amazing. Um, Doug D, 127K on his Class A. Yeah, great. Um, that's what you want, Doug. Uh, that means it's been well used. I got 140 on mine. Oh, good. Great. Yeah, stay on top of that stuff, Linda. All right. We're going to call her good. It's 8.30. Thanks so much, everybody, for watching. Be sure and support the channel. Give me that thumbs up. Always appreciate those. Those of you that gave the super chats, thank you so much. Uh, I'm very humbled and I'm very appreciative of um, your support of the channel. Uh, visit me over on the web, trbolin.com. Support me through my Amazon store. Links in the description below. Hello, Peter. Just wrapping her up. Um, I guess that's probably it. Thanks. We'll see you next week. And I promise... We will talk about buying an older RV, and again, mileage isn't the first thing you want to consider. But until then, as always, peace. Goodbye. Indeed, be well. Be well, all. We'll see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Good night.